Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 6H, where we're going to talk about the kinds of information about your phenotype that you can get from personal SNP typing. We'll talk about who provides this kind of information, what they actually offer in return for your money, and what kind of features to look for. But first, I want to mention a site that I just discovered that provides um, an integrated way to discover different companies that are providing personal genomics analysis of different kinds and also provides reviews. So the site's called dnatestingchoice.com. It's a British site. This is half of the categories that they consider theirs. The other half, they offer analyses of um, companies that are providing ancestry analysis, paternity analysis, and health analysis. And under each of these categories, they provide links to the sites, and they also provide, in many cases, their own reviews of the services that are provided by these sites. So I think this is a very good starting place if you're interested in having this kind of analysis done. Now, I'm only going to talk about two providers of SNP analysis that provide phenotype. Um, most of the providers are not in the United States. They're mostly British or European providers. Um, and you'll see why in just a second. The two companies I'm going to talk about are 23andMe and a company called Gene Planet, a British company. Here's 23andMe's website. Um, they're very general, but there's something you need to notice, which is this disclaimer here. What they're saying is that they no longer provide um, health-related genetic reports. So they no longer provide the phenotypic analysis, which is what I actually think was really their biggest strength. Um, they still provide their ancestry analysis. And the reason for this is that about oh, eight months ago, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration ordered them to stop giving new subscribers information about phenotype, the health-related stuff, the general phenotype stuff, because 23andMe had failed to give the FDA enough evidence that the information that they was, were providing was reliable. I think the concern, again, as I said, the chips themselves are very reliable, but it was the interpretation that the FDA was worried about. And initially, um, 23andMe had cooperated with the FDA because it's the FDA's responsibility to regulate health-related tests that are sold to the public. But then 23andMe stopped cooperating with the FDA. They were working on developing ways to assess um, what was appropriate to measure and what wasn't. Um, but they stopped, and the FDA naturally got a little snippy and eventually said that they had to stop providing health-related information. But only that only applies to new subscribers, so that existing subscribers have full access to the phenotype predictions. And I'm hoping that in the future, 23andMe will reach an agreement with the FDA that allows them to go back to providing the phenotypic information. Because they've got all this information, they're collecting all the SNP types on everybody, they're just not releasing the interpretations about phenotypes. Everyone, of course, still has access to all of the ancestry and relationship analyses, which are also very well done. Now, Here's the Gene Planet site. They offer a number of different um, sort of perspectives on SNP typing. Um, they'll do a nutritional analysis, a health analysis, other analyses as well. So for both companies, what you send them is a spit sample. They send you a tube, you drool in it for 10 minutes and send it back to them. And then they extract the DNA from it and analyze it. What you get in return from 23andMe, you get access to their SNP analysis website. As I said, at present, new subscribers don't get to see the phenotype information, but I'm going to describe it anyway because I think it is exemplary and it may become available again. And even if not, it provides a good framework for thinking about evaluating other sites that are providing this kind of information. Gene Planet 
instead provides you with a personalized 100-page bound report. I think it comes as a, in fact, as a book. Um, 23andMe lets you download your raw SNP data, and we'll talk in the next video about things you can do with that data. 23andMe doesn't do that. I think that part of the strength of what 23andMe offers is that it's not a static report. Instead, their website is constantly being updated with new information as the research community generates new information in genome-wide association studies and other research. Is there a preview? Well, for 23andMe there is. You can set up a free sample account which will let you preview an example genome. They describe it as um, Gregory Mendel's genome. As far as I know, GenePlanet doesn't have a preview, and I don't think they let you download your free your genome raw genome data. Now, the twenty the um, GenePlanet report is very well done, all the same. Um, the most important things there's a list of the kinds of analyses that they provide, but um, I very much liked the way that they present your results. They provide medical advice um, relevant to the particular trait, in this case an increased risk of developing asthma, and they give you a very nice graphical view of how big your risk is, that's your risk if you're at elevated risk, relative to the risk of people whose genotype isn't known. And so you can see that that's a modest increase in risk, maybe a 30% increase, it's bigger, but you can also see that this is a relatively common um, risk that many people get asthma, 13% of people get asthma, and you've got a nearly 18% chance. And because it's common, it deserves more of your concern than if it was doubling of the risk for something that you were very unlikely to get anyway. The other thing that I really like that I haven't seen in 23andMe is that they describe how the factors that determine whether or not you get asthma are distributed between the genes and the environment. So this is really a measure of heritability. And, of course, you want to be much more concerned about traits that have a large genetic component that are highly heritable. Um, if the trait is mostly caused by environmental factors, then you should focus on changing your environment. They give you a list of the traits that they report on. These are risk factors for diseases. These are factors that don't count as diseases, but are nevertheless quite important to people, whether or not you're going to go bald. Um, earwax type, which is not of itself interesting, but it has um, implications for risk of breast cancer and for how stinky your sweat is. Um, bitter taste perception is one that we can all relate to. And your responses to certain drugs, because for genes that control metabolic pathways, they can have strong influences on how sensitive you are to different drug treatments. Now, 23andMe's list of things that they report on initially looks smaller, but in fact, there are more reports, 120 health risk reports, 50 reports on carrier status. Remember, carrier is telling you whether you might be heterozygous for a mutation that causes a serious problem when it's homozygous. If you click, click through, you'll see that they cover a large number of traits. Um, and they report on, again, elevated risk and also on reduced risk. What I like best about the 23andMe's phenotype reports about health risks is the ranking system that they use. They sort the traits that they're going to report, not by how scary they are, or by 
how much your risk has changed. You've got double the risk of this, but you've only got a 50% increase the risk of that. Instead, they rank them first by how good the research is. That's the confidence number. That's this. That's the, first, the ones that show up at the top are the ones that have the strongest scientific data supporting them. And I think that's very important because even though the research is all of high quality, in many cases, the results are turning out in later studies to not be as strong or as consistent as we might hope. The second thing that they rank them by is by the absolute risk. This is like what I showed you for Gene Planet, that they put those um, risks that are common at the top of the list, even though the relative risk here, relative risk of Alzheimer's is lower, that's all, this person is twofold increased risk of it, Alzheimer's, they have threefold increased risk of these other traits, lupus and celiac disease, but because these diseases are much less common, they're not ranked as highly, they're not as important for you to think about. Now, they don't, of course, only report on increased risk. They also report on decreased risk. This is the good news side of the reports. And again, they're ranked first by confidence, the quality of the science, and then by how common the problem is. Now, from the 23andMe um, website for any, for, for example, for your um, phenotypes of decreased risk, you can click through to get additional information. So if you click on the rheumatoid arthritis link, you're taken to a page with more detailed information about rheumatoid arthritis and an explanation of the odds calculator. This is the odds ratio that we talked about earlier. Um, there's a number of links from within here. There's an explanation of how rheumatoid arthritis works, a timeline, a doctor's perspective, resources. This includes links to support groups and other medical resources, a technical report, which I'll come back to in a sec, and a community where you can engage in a discussion forum with other people who are concerned about this phenotype. I particularly like the technical report because it gives you detailed information about the SNPs that underlie their assignment of risk and it lets you go directly to the technical information. So here's one of the SNPs that's associated with the differences in risk of rheumatoid arthritis and you're told the name of the SNP, your particular genotype, the relative risk, um, the population, this was based on studies done on Europeans, and you're given direct links to re the research articles on which this risk factor was calculated. So you can click on these links and actually see the papers. Here's one here for that's assigning this SNP locus this level of risk. You may or may not be able to read the whole, you will definitely be able to read the abstract, a summary of the article. Depending on your library access, you may be able to read the whole article for free, or you may be able to pay to read it. Now, there's often more than one SNP underlying their calculation of risk. And in this case, they report on two different SNPs, this one we just discussed, and another one, um, again on a European population, um, again with a list of research papers assigning risk to this particular SNP. In this particular case, in fact, they used information from nine different locations in the genome to calculate your total overall risk of rheumatoid arthritis. And I really appreciate being able to see how the risk was calculated. It gives me more confidence in the numbers. Now, so we've talked a bit about what's available. Um, I think there's a lot more available in Europe than in America. 
um, because in America the Food and Drug Administration is cracking down on providers who haven't given them sufficient evidence of the quality of what they're offering. Um, you want to look for simple explanations, minimal hype. They're not trying to, to trick you into paying them lots of money. You want to look at the depth of information that's available. And these things are changing very fast. New companies are coming into the uh, market and moving out of it. So you really want to use resources like the one I showed you at the beginning of the lecture to check on what's currently available. Now, coming up next, um, we're going to talk about ancestry analysis. But before we do that, I have um, another video about using your raw SNP data. It's not got the number in sequence because it was added as a bit of an afterthought. But if you're interested in um, analyzing phenotypes, even though 23andMe won't tell you, um, that's one of the things I'm going to discuss. So I hope to see you there.